Hello, Nick here, and welcome back to the channel, and our dramatic reading continues of The Hatchet by Gary Paulson. I want to thank the subscribers and the commenters for encouraging me to continue this book. Uh, if you're new to the channel, what I do is I put some books out there, and if people like them, they want to hear more, drop a comment. Let me, let me know. We've got limited time. This is a labor of love. I want to keep reading what people are listening to. And the audience has spoken. We continue with The Hatchet, and we are picking up on Chapter 11. There were these things to do. He transferred all the eggs. Remember, he found eggs from a snapping turtle or some kind of turtle uh, buried in the sand near his, his little camp, and it was good food, a good find. He transferred all the eggs from the small beach into the shelter, reburying them near his sleeping area. It took all of his will to keep from eating another one of them as he moved them, but he got it done, and when they were out of sight again, it was easier. He added wood to the fire and cleaned up the camp area. A good laugh, that, cleaning up the camp. All he did was shake out his windbreaker and hang it in the sun to dry, the berry juice that had soaked in, and smooth the sand where he slept. You know, he doesn't really have much else. Isn't that amazing? Just to have so little in your life that cleaning up involves maybe shaking out the one or two worldly possessions that uh, you had and sh sh smoothing some dirt out. Wow. I mean, some... Kind of crazy, but also some strange beauty in that simplicity. But it was, as it says here, it was a mental thing. He had gotten depressed thinking about how they hadn't found him yet. And when he was busy and had something to do, the depression seemed to leave. So there were things to do. With the camp squared away, he brought in more wood. He decided to always have enough on hand for three days. And after spending one night with the fire... Uh, for a friend he knew what a staggering hmm. after oh wait he decided to always have enough on hand for three days and after spending one night with the fire for a friend he knew what a staggering amount of wood it would take oh this for after i'm so sorry here for after spending one night with the fire for a friend it should be like a comma there or something he knew what a staggering amount of wood it would take for that fire to be there for him all night as his friend he worked all through the morning at the wood, breaking down dead limbs and breaking or chopping them in smaller pieces, storing them neatly beneath the overhang. He stopped once to take a drink at the lake, and in his reflection, he saw the swelling on his head was nearly gone. The swelling from when he took the injury when the plane crashed. Just shows how much time is passing, too. There was no pain there, so he assumed that he had, that, that had taken care of itself. His leg, Could you imagine if he had a concussion or some brain injury? He would be totally in trouble. His leg was also back to normal, although he had a small pattern of holes roughly star-shaped where the quills had nailed him, and while he was standing at the lake shore taking stock, he noticed that his body was changing. He had never been fat, but he had been slightly heavy with a little extra weight just above his belt at the sides. This was completely gone, and his stomach had caved in to the hunger, and the sun had cooked him past burning. So he was tanning, and with the smoke from the fire, his face was starting to look like leather. But perhaps more than his body was the change in his mind, or than the way he was, was becoming. I'm not the same, he thought. I see and hear differently. He did not know when the change started, but it was there. When a sound came to him now, he didn't just hear it, but would know the sound. He would swing and look at it, a breaking twig, a movement of air, and knew the sound as if, some, as if he somehow could move his mind back down the wave of sound to the source. Interesting. He could know what the sound was before he quite realized he had heard it. And when he saw something, a bird moving a wing inside a bush or a ripple on the water, he would truly see that thing. Not just notice it, as he used to notice things in the city. He would see all parts of it. See the whole wing, the feathers. See the color of the feathers. See the bush and the size and shape and color of its leaves. He would see the way the light moved with the ripples on the water and see that the wind made the ripples and which way that wind had to blow to make the ripples move in that certain way. Amazing, these uh, heightened powers of perception and just sort of presence 
in the moment like this. None of that used to be in Brian, and now it was a part of him, a changed part of him, a grown part of him. And the two things, his mind and his body, had come together as well, had made a connection with each other that he didn't quite understand. When his ears heard a sound or his eyes saw a sight, his mind took control of his body. Without his thinking, he moved to face the sound or sight, moved to make ready for it, to deal with it. There were these things to do. When the wood was done, he decided to get a signal fire ready. He moved to the top of the rock ridge that comprised the bluff over his shoulder and was pleased to find a large, flat stone area. More wood, he thought, moaning inwardly. He went back to the fallen trees and found more dead limbs, carrying them up on the rock until he had enough for a bonfire. Initially, he had thought of making a signal fire every day, but he couldn't. He would never be able to keep the wood supply going. So while he was working, he decided to have the fire ready, and if he heard an engine, or even thought he heard a plane engine, he would run up with a burning limb and set off the signal fire. Things to do. At the last trip to the top of the stone bluff with the wood, he stopped, sat on the point overlooking the lake, and rested. The lake lay before him, twenty or so feet below, and he had not seen it this way since he had come in with the plane. Remembering the crash, he had a moment of fear, a breath-tightening little rip of terror. But it passed, and he was quickly caught up in the beauty of the scenery. It was so incredibly beautiful that it was almost unreal. From his height, he could see not just the lake, but across part of the forest, a green carpet, and it was full of life. Birds, insects... There was a constant hum and song. At the other end of the bottom of the L, this is the shape of the lake, there was another large rock sticking out over the water, and on top of the rock, a snaggly pine had somehow found food and grown, bent and gnarled. Sitting on one limb was a bluebird with a crest and sharp beak, a kingfisher. He thought of a picture he had seen once, which left the branch while he watched and dove into the water. It emerged a split part of a second later. In its mouth was a small fish, wiggling silver in the sun. It took the fish to a limb, juggled it twice, and swallowed it whole. Fish. Of course, he thought. There were fish in the lake, and they were food. Again, just this power of heightened observations, like drawing these conclusions, uncovering assets, resources, potential. Pretty exciting. So there were fish in the lake and they were food. And if a bird can do it, he scrambled down the side of the bluff and trotted to the edge of the lake, looking down into the water. Somehow it had never occurred to him to look inside the water, only at the surface. The sun was flashing back up into his eyes and he moved off to the side and took his shoes off and waded out 15 feet. Then he turned and stood still with the sun at his back and studied the water again. It was, he saw, after a moment, literally packed with life. Small fish swam everywhere, some narrow and long, some round, most of them three or four inches long, some a bit larger and many smaller. There was a patch of mud off to the side leading into deeper water, and he could see old clam shells there. So there must be clams. As he watched, a crayfish, looking like a tiny lobster, left one of the empty clam shells and went to another, looking for something to eat, digging with its claws. While he stood, some of the small, roundish fish came quite close to his legs, and he tensed, got ready, and made a wild stab at grabbing one of them. They exploded away in a hundred flicks of quick light, so fast that he had no hope of catching them that way. But they soon came back, seemed to be curious about him, and as he walked from the water, he tried to think of a way to use that curiosity to catch them. He had no hooks or string, but if he could somehow lure the fish into the shallows and make a spear, a small fish spear, he might be able to strike fast enough to get one. 
He would have to find the right kind of wood, slim and straight. He, would, he had seen some willows up along the lake that might work, and he could use the hatchet to sharpen it and shape it while he was sitting by the fire tonight. And that brought up the fire, which he had to feed again. He looked at the sun, saw it was getting late in the afternoon, and when he, saw, when he thought of how late it was, he thought that he ought to reward all his work with another egg. And that made him think that some kind of dessert would be nice. He smiled and thought of dessert. So fancy. And he wondered if he should move up the lake and see if he could find some raspberries after he banked the fire and while he was looking for the right wood for a spear. Spear wood, he thought. And it all rolled together. Just rolled together and rolled over him. There were things to do. You can just kind of feel the, the hope, the determination, uh, the ownership of the situation that's evolving in the, the mindset of this main character um, that our author is telling us about. And it's exciting to see how uh, Brian's experience is going to change now that he starts to feel his power and start to really take ownership of the present moment that he's in instead of sort of fighting it. So that's why I love the book. It's so much a, a coming of age. That's all young adult fiction is a coming of age sort of experience. And I think Gary Paulson just nailed it with this story. I hope you're enjoying it. Thanks again for subscribing and for the comments and the feedback. It's, it helps motivate me to, to get through these, uh, these projects. And um, hopefully we'll see you on the next chapter.